Hi, I'm David Camp, and I'm coming at you from the library room of my little house in Northwest Connecticut. I split time between here and New York City, and I wrote Sunny Days, my new book, in both those places. I had the idea for this book in 2015, which seems like an eternity ago in terms of all the news we've lived through. But even then, pre-pandemic and pre-extreme political polarization, I sensed a certain brokenness in American society that needed remedying. I wanted to historically immerse myself in a time when Americans of noble intent did something constructive to fix a societal wrong, and my head turned to children's television. I am a Generation Zero Sesame Street viewer. My mom, who was a research scientist, in 1969 read some article in a newspaper, you know, public television to debut experimental TV program aimed at preschool children. Well, she happened to have a preschool child, me, and so I was one of the first people to watch on November 10th, 1969, when Sesame Street had its premiere. Now, there's an element of nostalgia to Sunny Days, my book, but that's not the real reason I decided to pursue this subject. In retrospect, in considering these programs that I grew up with and millions of other kids did, uh, Sesame Street, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, The Electric Company, Schoolhouse Rock, Marlo Thomas's Free to Be You and Me, what I find interesting about them is that they were more than just a slate of educational children's programming. They amounted to a social movement of sorts, a kind of children's liberation movement to kind of educate kids and change American childhood for the better. And I thought no one's looked at this in that way, of these programs as a social movement. So I thought it would be fun and um, po potentially uplifting to, to, to look at these programs that way. The history of these children's television programs is a history of American ingenuity. It's a history of people saying something is wrong with our society, and specifically Sesame Street was initially conceived to address the education gap between affluent, uh, relatively affluent suburban kids and inner city kids who didn't have the same resources. And how do we write that wrong? And could that wrong be righted through the use of television? At the time that was controversial because much like now, there was a big question of, can screens really be used to educate? And a lot of rigorous preparation went into preparing Sesame Street about three years from 66 to 69 before it aired. And so Sesame Street was the great te test case. And in its wake came the electric company and Free to Be You and Me and Schoolhouse Rock. And all of these, what all these programs had in common was that the people who made them, they didn't get into TV for the financial incentive or for stardom. They got into it because they wanted to right a societal wrong and improve educational opportunities for children of all classes and all races across America. And it worked. How awesome is that? It worked. So I wanted to uh, delve into the history of, of, of a great American experiment, an exercise in American ingenuity that succeeded. When Sesame Street was first conceived in its most embryonic form, it was at a dinner party where uh, two friends, Joan Gans Cooney, who at the time was a documentary producer for Channel 13, New York's public television station, and Lloyd Morissette, who was a young executive at the philanthropic Carnegie Corporation, they fell into conversation about could TV be used to address the issues of kids with few resources in inner cities uh, being able to, to watch TV and therefore be educated. At the Carnegie Corporation, where Lloyd Morissette worked, people looked down their noses at TV, and Lloyd Morissette had to do a lot of persuading to get his own workplace to grant money even for a study to see if children's educational television at this scale was feasible. So there was a lot of skepticism in the early days about could TV be used to teach, because Earlier in that same decade, Newton Minow, who was JFK's director of the Federal Communications Commission, he gave a speech in which he said television at its worst was a vast wasteland, vast wasteland. It became etched into society, into the lexicon of society. But Newton Minow, with whom I spoke for this book, he's 94 years old and still kicking, he said that that speech of his has been so misunderstood because he wasn't saying that all of television 
was a vast wasteland. He was saying that at its worst, television programming represented a vast wasteland, but he specifically called for educational children's programming as a way forward for TV. And it's extraordinary. It was kind of like how at the beginning of that decade, the 60s, JFK said, we're going to get to the moon. And lo, by the end of that decade, Americans did get to the moon. It's very similar. It's sort of the same time period. Beginning of the decade, Newton Minow was calling for a great reinvention of television as a means of education. And lo, by the end of the decade, same year as the moon launch or uh, the moon landing, Sesame Street debuted. You have to remember that in 1969, no one knew what the children's television workshop was. No one knew what Sesame Street was. No one knew who Oscar Crouch and Big Bird were. And in fact, uh, Loretta Long, who played Susan, who is the black maternal figure on the show, she said that when she described her new job to her parents back in Michigan, who were farmers, and she said, mom and dad, I'm going to be on TV and I'm going to be talking to this giant yellow bird and it's going to be amazing and kids are going to be watching her parents thought she was having sort of some sort of drug-induced hallucination she said she said they're like but what's your real job honey and she said it's a good thing i didn't tell them about oscar because if i said and then this monster is going to come out of a trash can and yell at you she said they would have been on the first train to new york coming to take me home thinking i was having a breakdown so it was really important for the Children's Television Workshop, the entity that produced Sesame Street, to basically have the equivalent of a get the vote out campaign. And they were really ingenious about this. There was a huge community outreach department called the Department of Utilization that was especially targeting mostly black neighborhoods and Latino neighborhoods in the inner cities because they really wanted these programs initially to connect most with kids of limited resources who needed a leg up, kind of like the Head Start program, before they even entered kindergarten. And so there were literal promotional vehicles. Con Ed, the, the, the New York-based York utility, lent trucks that had TVs in them, which could play you know, reel-to-reel -reel tapes of Sesame Street before the show had even aired. And they passed out leaflets at a football game between Grambling State and Morgan State, two historically black colleges, uh, just so that that largely black audience or, or, or uh, football uh, uh, football viewership could be even aware of Sesame Street's existence. And so, and they also established viewing centers in uh, the common rooms of the housing projects in black churches, um, lots of lots of different places, even in Washington D.C.'s Ward Eight, which was a predominantly African-American poor neighborhood, even a 7-Eleven was used as a viewing center. So there was this concerted, massive effort to get word of Sesame Street out and to get access to Sesame Street out. Getting Jim Henson was a big coup for the producers of Sesame Street because Jim Henson was already an extremely successful puppeteer, he was a millionaire by the time he was 30. He had a flourishing career in advertising. He had already had a small program on local Baltimore TV and DC area TV called Sam and Friends. And he had a lucrative advertising career doing coffee commercials and snack commercials for Frito-Lay using his Muppets. And Kermit already existed, although Kermit wasn't necessarily a frog yet. Kermit was just some sort of cute amorphous creature. But when Jim Henson got this opportunity or this request to participate in this new educational experimental program called Sesame Street. He had four kids of his own, four young kids, soon to be five. And he thought this is a chance to really make a difference. He recognized that television, which had made him, you know, had made him rich already as a young man, had such a great potential. And he didn't look down his nose upon TV. He saw it as a revolutionary medium. And very quickly, he put aside his lucrative advertising career. In fact, he had a monster in one of the last commercials he made for Frito-Lay called the Munchos Monster. And this monster liked savory rather than sweet snacks. So he was me like Munchos. But very soon, the Munchos Monster would be dyed a different shade. Uh, he'd become blue rather than some kind of purple he was. And rather than liking Munchos, a savory treat, he turned his attention to cookies and the rest is history. Contemporaneous to Sesame Street's development, Fred Rogers at WQED in Pittsburgh 
He was a Presbyterian minister who quite literally felt that TV was a religious calling. That again, he saw the medium of TV like Jim Henson and like Joan Gans Cooney as a potentially revolutionary medium that if used correctly, could make a huge difference in children, huge difference in children's lives. In his case, he saw TV as a means to educate children and make them comfortable about their own emotional intelligence. In other words, it's okay for you to have feelings, to feel anger, to fear, to feel fear and anxiousness, and to feel exaltation and joy. And he was really working on educational and emotional intelligence. And even simple things like when Fred Rogers entered his set, that living room set singing, It's a Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, he deliberately walked screen left to screen right because he worked with a developmental psychologist named Margaret McFarland. And they determined that, of course, that's how a kid learns to read. That's how people read in English language, their eyes scanning left to right. So that's how thoroughly thought out and calibrated Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood was. Marlo Thomas was a huge sitcom star, second generation sitcom star, because her dad, Danny Thomas, starred in a sitcom called Make Room for Daddy. And she had just finished the run of her successful sitcom, which was called That Girl. And she was a big second wave feminist. She was friends with Gloria Steinem and the other founders of Ms. Magazine. And she had a young niece. And when she was buying gifts for her niece, she was appalled by how siloed gender roles were when you bought toys and books for girls, that little girls were supposed to become housewives and mommies and boys were supposed to become doctors and lawyers. And she thought, she thought, how can I use the medium of TV, but also the medium of records? Because Free to Be You and Me was originally a record album. But how can I use these media to reach kids and educate them about gender roles and to teach a girl that she could grow up to be anything she wanted to be and to teach a boy that he didn't have to uh, withhold his emotions, that it was all right to cry. And she conceived of this concept called Free to Be You and Me and gathered a bunch of her celebrity friends like Alan Alda and Roberta Flack and Michael Jackson and Harry Belafonte and also some of her feminist friends like Gloria Steinem and Letty Cotton Pogervin brought them all together and said, let's create this record album, which then became a successful book and TV special about gender roles. And, and it was basically kind of a radical feminist primer for young kids. And the amazing thing about this early 70s era is that this was not seen as controversial. There was widespread buy-in to Free to Be You and Me. And in fact, its lessons were uh, incorporated into the curricula of 35 of 50 public school systems in the United States. I think that right now we're waiting for the next revolution in children's television. Sesame Street is still on 51 years after its founding, and it is still doing amazing work. Uh, there, it, it's still, Sesame Street is still doing God's work in that it was originally conceived to help the most marginalized kids in terms of uh, poverty and, and limited resources. And now they have a Muppet character who's autistic. And in the South African edition of Sesame Street, there is a Muppet who is HIV positive, just so that kids watching at home who are in these circumstances can feel, I am seen, I am not alone. That said, it's a more sanitized and cutesy show than the, than the kind of wild and woolly early 70s Sesame Street that I grew up with. I kind of think we're waiting for the next big thing. And interestingly, this pandemic, I think, is forcing a kind of educational reckoning. We all know that there's no substitute for in-person parent, student, or excuse me, there is no substitute for in-person teacher-student interface. That said, we know that we're going to have at least a new semi-normal for as long as this pandemic persists, and even after the pandemic is thankfully over, we're gonna have to have pandemic preparedness wherein we know we're gonna have to teach through screens more. And so rather than muddling through, as I feel so sorry for all the teachers and parents of young kids who had to muddle through March, April, May, and June with this improvised approach to uh, remote learning through screens, we're gonna have to have a permanent script for this. And we're going to have to have the same level of rigorous preparation and ingenuity as the people at the Children's Television Workshop and the people who created Schoolhouse Rock and the people who created Free to Be You and Me and Fred Rogers creating Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. That level of rigorous preparedness and testing 
So we know that teaching through screens and reaching kids through screens can be done, but only through preparedness and through enlisting not just educational pros, but entertainment pros, because it's just as important that, that, that Sesame Street had Jim Henson and a guy named John Stone, who was the show's original showrunner, who had a background in network television. All of those factors have to come together to create successful, revolutionary, educational children's television. Libraries, since I was a kid, have been a refuge and a haven. Uh, I'm recording this on a hot summer day, and I remember there being hot summer days where not just because of the air conditioning, although partly because of the air conditioning, but you could just get away and immerse yourself in a book. And I always saw librarians as kindly benevolent figures who could help you out. And in researching this book, Sunny Days, libraries were of immeasurable help. Um, there are closed collections that are available to people if you just ask. And one of the most valuable to me was at the University of Maryland. There is one called the Hornbake Library, a private collection, a private library that has the archives of the Children's Television Workshop. And it was so fun and so fascinating and so revelatory to look at these letters and papers and minutes from meetings where you can see in real time the decisions that result in the creation of characters like Count Von Tounce and Big Bird and Roosevelt Franklin, who is this amazing black Muppet character who was my favorite early Sesame Street character. And the librarians at the Hornbake Library were just there to guide me through these mounds and masses of, of files and information. And I found that to be true wherever I went, at St. Vincent's College in Western Pennsylvania, where a lot of the Fred Rogers archives are. So librarians and libraries are, they're the unsung heroes of American scholarship. And just, just if, you, if you like reading nonfiction, I could not have gotten where I got with this book. It wouldn't have been as thorough or as fun or as entertaining or as enthusiastic from my standpoint if I didn't have the help of first-rate libraries and librarians. I also want to stress that part of the fun of this book is that it also takes place in the late 60s and early 70s in a kind of kooky, artistic climate, wherein you had, you had Peter Max, that Peter Max aesthetic visually, you had psychedelia, you had rock music and the Beatles, which informed a lot of the great songs. Like think about all the indelible songs of Sesame Street, I've Got Two Eyes, One, Two, and Schoolhouse Rock, Conjunction, Junction, What's Your Function? It's part of the fun of the book, and I think part of the reason why these programs succeeded so much in impressing lessons upon young brains like mine at the time was that these songs are more than just sticky in, in the sense of like they stick in your brain so when you progress in kindergarten and first grade, you remember those lessons. They're more than sticky. They're indelible, meaning I'm an elderly 54 years old, and yet I can still sing those Sesame Street and Schoolhouse Rock and Free to You and Me songs word for word. And those lessons have stayed with me. They were imparted to me when I was four, five, and six. And by God, they're still here with me.